Hello, welcome to Global Connections here on Think Tech's live streaming network. I'm your host, Grace Chang, here today with Dr. Sarah Yamin to talk about the next U.S. president and implications for peace and security in South Asia. Hello, Sarah. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for inviting me, Grace. I'm delighted to be here. So we have a very interesting topic. Um, one of the interesting things about this election's outcome is that there's going to be a lot to, to talk about. And one of the things is, you know, what the implications are for U.S. foreign policy as well as politics in different regions. And so I'm so glad you can come be with us and talk about the implications for the regions that you have expertise in. Um, uh, I'd like to know a little bit of your background before we begin. Grace, I'm an academic by background, and I work for the Asia Pacific Center for Security Study here in Honolulu, Hawaii, which is a U.S. Department of Defense executive education program. Uh, but I would like to uh, uh, state that my opinions today do not represent those of the organization or the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, I, I would like to talk about uh, South Asia, uh, the implications and perceptions over there, the reactions to the U.S. Um, elections, if, uh, if you, you would like me to, and let me know. Yeah, sounds great. <laughs> you know, because the two candidates for the U.S. presidency were very, very different, and they had very different stated positions on foreign policy, including for, for South Asia. Um, so interesting to know what the reactions have been uh, in, in South Asia about the results of this election. Right, Grace. So you're very right. Both candidates were very different, as you know. And in fact, a lot of people were watching the elections for a number of re reasons, of course, the U United States being a very, very important one, probably the most powerful, uh, politically preeminent uh, country in the world. Uh, but also the prospect of uh, uh, Secretary Clinton, the first woman uh, mm. uh, being elected, was being watched in South Asia, uh, Asia with a lot of interest, uh, especially because South Asia has produced more uh, women heads of state mm -hmm. than any other country in the world, including Indira Gandhi, Benazir Bhutto, the Bangladeshi incumbent mm -hmm. right now, Sheikh Hasina, uh, Sri Lanka has had two heads of states, and in fact, the first ever democratically elected uh, woman uh, was elected in um, Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So, so you have a number of, <laughs> you know, uh, um, you've seen a number of women uh, presidents and prime ministers, and so everyone was watching. So, is is this going? Is Hillary going to break the glass ceiling? It didn't happen. Now, with Hillary, of course, there was also. Uh, uh, I think the understanding that uh, the U.S. Uh, policies in South Asia and the world in general are uh, probably not going to change significantly, and she's going to probably carry on the Obama legacy. Mm -hmm. Now, with the president-elect, Mr. Trump, um, who has promised to be the harbinger of peace, uh, there has been a little bit of, uh, I would say, concern. Uh, because uh, people uh, are not sure in general what the change really means. And to be very honest, I think there have been some mixed messages, uh, positive, mm -hmm. and in some senses you could say that some, some of the messages have been very, you know, very tough rhetoric. So some of these, um, some of the concerns in South Asia, of course, are um, regarding U.S. engagement in the region, the U.S. has been very, very involved. It has had a very prominent, very strong footprint, um, and it, ha it has had close relations, uh, and it continues to with many of the countries in South Asia. India, of course, is one of them, the world's largest democracy. And uh, in fact, um, um, Mr. Trump had said that uh, India's, uh, the United States' uh, relationship with India is going to be strengthened. So it's not going to be a departure mm -hmm. from uh, the previous, um, uh, from the incumbent regime. It's going to continue, and probably he wants to make it even stronger. But at the same time, um, in India, in, uh, India has a very um, close economic partnership with, uh, with the United States. And uh, it is perceived as, or, or immigration and trade is perceived as a key driver of that relationship from, from, uh, from that vantage point of view, uh, from that vantage point. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so in India, there is a concern that there is going to be restrictions on immigration. Now, mm -hmm. um, 
and on the uh, H-1B visa policy, which allows or facilitates uh, the immigration of skilled foreign workers to the United States. And there are mm -hmm. tens of thousands mm -hmm. of Indians uh, working in the United States. Uh, uh, many of them are IT uh, professionals. So there is concern that they're, they're not going to be able to do that. And because Mr. Trump had announced that uh, he is going to make, uh, he is going to curtail um, immigration and offshoring. Mm -hmm. um, so, so how is that going to go? And that's, uh, so that is going to be a concern. In fact, as you may have uh, heard a few days ago, the Prime Minister of Britain went to India. This yes. was a, sort of her first international big visit after Brexit. Mm -hmm. And she uh, received what they call a very rocky relationship in India. She was obviously hoping to strike a lot of trade deals, mm -hmm. trying to demonstrate mm -hmm. that Britain can pull it off without being part of uh, the, 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 you know, the, that block, yes. um, the European Union. But the first thing that she really heard from Prime Minister Modi was that India's relationship with Britain is going to be defined by opportunities for education uh -huh. for Indian youth and their mobility. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and uh, Prime Minister Theresa May has, um, you know, she, they have tightened their immigration policy. They do not want to relax their uh, yes. uh, immig uh, visa policy. So, so, so I think it's going to come up if. Uh, Mr. Trump plans to restrict mm -hmm. opportunities for Indians going to India, working in India, and um, Indians who are hired for U.S. jobs in India, mm -hmm. as you're aware. So, of course, that's going to be one concern. Then um, uh, there are many Muslim countries. In yes. four out of eight countries um, in South Asia are Muslim primarily pro predominantly Muslim countries, including Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, uh, and the Maldives. And of course, India also has a very large Muslim population, about 170 yes. million. So as you uh, are aware, some of uh, Mr. Trump's rhetoric on Muslims and Muslim countries in general has been uh, rather hard, right? Yes. So what are the implications um, for Muslim countries? Are there, there is this concern. At the same time, um, as I was mentioning some of those mixed messages earlier, um, Mr. Trump has talked about um, helping to diffuse tensions between India and Pakistan, which are two countries, two nuclear arch rivals mm -hmm. in South Asia. And Pakistan is a Muslim country. India is a predominantly Hindu country. And there, um, when President, former President Clinton went to South Asia in 2002, he visited Kashmir, which is a disputed territory, one of the world's oldest unresolved conflicts. And he called mm -hmm. it the world's most dangerous part mm -hmm. and Mr. Trump referred to it as a tinderbox as well and he said mm -hmm. he would he would love to mediate tensions between mm -hmm. India and Pakistan if he were invited by both parties so that is being looked at or being noted very positively on the Pakistani side at least because they would welcome that yes. um, and I think it's it's a very good time for Mr. Trump to seize the opportunity because as you may be aware in recent months, um, violence has resurged in the Kashmir Valley, in Indian-held uh, Kashmir, disputed um, territory. And um, the Indian forces ha have used, um, uh, you know, these pellet ammunitions. They have targeted mm -hmm. the protesters, rioters, a lot of youth. And so uh, tensions are rising between India and Pakistan mm -hmm. as well, because India alleged uh, or claims that Pakistan has a hand mm -hmm. or it provides support to some of these militant groups. Um, so, and uh, I I India in um, recent weeks also claimed to make some surgical strikes in Pakistan, which uh -huh. Pakistan denied, but there has, there has been an escalation of cross-border fire. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned earlier, th these are both nuclear arch rivals with contiguous borders. Yes, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Right. So these are some of the concerns, uh, immigration, trade. Then, of course, there's geopolitics. So some of uh, Mr. Trump's um, 
campaign rhetoric was about disengaging in some ways from the world. And so, so there is uncertainty about, well, what does that dis disengagement really mean for the United States? Right. Is the United States not going to lead the world as it has mm -hmm. for many, many decades now? Is it going to create, a, you know, step away from the region mm -hmm. in some ways and create space for Russia and China? Mm -hmm. Um, to get more involved or to work more closely with some of these countries. And remember, South Asia is within China's uh, sphere of influence. Yes. It has borders with six out of eight uh, South Asian countries. Russia also has very close defense ties with India. It mm -hmm. has ha mm -hmm. historically had a yes. very close relationship with India. Um, so these are all questions. Uh, so is, is, is uh, Mr. Trump going to carve out a new ge geopolitical trajectory for the United States? How different is the world going to look? The good news, um, Grace, is that all the South Asian leaders have congratulated Mr. Trump on his election, mm -hmm. and they all want to work with him. And I think that's important yes. for everyone to work together, because this world, it's a, uh, an interconnected world, as you're aware. Yes, right. It's an era of unprecedented globalization, and it's very difficult to operate on your own with, without uh, cooperation and collaboration and dialogue with other countries. Yes, yes, and it, it kind of also shows that, yeah, like despite, you know, Mr. Trump's rhetoric, he, you know, he has to acknowledge that there are really important roles that the U.S. have been playing in the region and because of the, the tensions that might be existing between some of the states. And that's one of the things that he said, um, which maybe causes more concern on the Pakistan side is that he sort of described Pakistan as, as a, a very dangerous country and he's been very, very critical of them accusing Pakistan of, of harboring terrorism, of you know, be, uh, a refuge for, for uh, Osama bin Laden until the U.S. Uh, found him. In, in the, and so I think the reactions of the different states must be different, but they still, they still don't want the U.S. to disengage. Oh, absolutely not. And you're absolutely right. The U.S. has played a very important role. Sometimes it's welcomed, uh, that role is welcomed, sometimes it's not. You know, sometimes it's helped the region, sometimes it, it has complicated the situation in a number of, of ways. But there have been, you know, many, many, uh, there are many positive examples of successes of U.S. intervention in 2001. Uh, two, for instance, there was a year-long um, um, face-off, military face-off between India and Pakistan after, uh, this is soon after 9-11 happened, mm -hmm. there was an attack on, on the Indian parliament mm -hmm. and uh, the Indian government alleged this attack was orchestrated by militants with, uh, which had covert support from the Pakistani establishment. And so they deployed uh, about half a million troops along the Pakistani border. Very dangerous situation to, you know, mm -hmm. these two nuclear yes. um, uh, neighbors. And Pakistan uh, r responded in a tit for tat fa uh, fashion. And it was then, it was some um, mediation by the United States mm -hmm. uh, uh, that really helped to thaw the tensions between the two countries. Mm -hmm. So Pakistan, in particular, is always looking for uh, U.S intervention or facilitation or mediation. Right, right. So, so that would be an interesting thing to watch for because that is, and, and we also have Afghanistan next door. So, That's right. So we'll come back and after this break and talk a little bit more about that. Thank you so much, Saira. Thank you, Grace. All right. Join us at Think Tech of Hawaii. Our show is Asia in Review. Our next program is on November 17th. This is Johnson Choi, your host. Aloha everyone, I hope you've been watching ThinkTech Hawaii, but I'm here to invite you to watch me on Viva Hawaii every Monday at 3 p.m. I'm waiting for you. Mahalo. Aloha everybody, my name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Hey everybody, my name is David Chang and I'm the new host of a new show, The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to share with you secrets on giving yourself the smart edge in life. We're going to have awesome guests and great mentors of mine from the political, military, business, nonprofit, you name it. So it's something for everybody. Hi, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, here talking with Dr. Syra Yamin about the new 
or the next U.S. president and its implications for peace and security in South Asia. Welcome back, Syrah. Happy to be here. Grace. And, and we were talking before the break about how the different countries in the region are feeling about um, possibly the potential direction change that, that U.S. policy in the region could take. Um, and, and we don't know yet, but based on the stated positions of, of uh, President-elect Trump, you know, there, there are possible changes in the dynamics. But one of the things that all, it seems that all the South Asian states hope is that the U.S. will not completely disengage because historically and, and re up until recent times, uh, playing an important role as far as helping to diminish and, and um, maybe move towards uh, alleviating some of the tensions in the region. That's right, Grace. And you are absolutely, absolutely right in suggesting that uh, Pakistan is concerned that the U.S. is going to increasingly lean further, even more towards India, and maybe uh, y you talked about some of pres uh, President-elect's rhetoric about Pakistan harboring terrorists, and that you know it's, he's, he's going to be uh, probably more hardline. So there is that concern. And U.S.-Pakistan have had quite a difficult relationship. They've had mm -hmm. a long, uh, a very long, historically, they've been uh, allies, but it's been a very difficult alliance. It's been a difficult relationship. Although I would add that Pakistan was instrumental in as a bridge builder between the United States and China mm -hmm. also. Yes. And Pakistan um, was also a key player in the, uh, in the Cold War where uh, it was fighting, uh, so to speak, a proxy war on behalf of the United States. It was actually a conduit for arms and ammunition uh, during the Soviet-Afghan war mm -hmm. that, were, yes. uh, that were being supplied by the United States. And uh, also there was a lot of support from uh, Saudi Arabia. So Pakistan was a conduit for all the support for the Afghan Mujahideen that were uh, fighting the communists at that time. And this, at that time, the U.S. involvement and the support to the uh, Afghan Mujahideen hastened the collapse of the Soviet empire. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Historically, Pakistan um, and the United States have had a very, very, you know, it's a close, difficult, yes, there is a very difficult relationship with Pakistan, but at the same time, it has to be remembered, Pakistan is also receiving a lot of aid. It is one mm -hmm. amongst the highest recipients of aid, development aid, as well as military aid from the United States. Um, India, of course, India has actually shifted uh, its positioning towards the United States in recent decades. Uh, since President Clinton, former President Clinton actually made uh, very friendly overtures towards India. Mm -hmm. and traditionally, India had been pro-Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, and they, uh, India uh, appeared very skeptical of the United States on may, many levels. But now they, you know, they're very, uh, they're working very closely uh, with the United States, especially under Prime Minister Modi. So, so you do see. Uh, a strategic uh, partnership being forged by these two countries, that, you know, uh, uh, some, um, amongst the two largest democracies in the world. Uh, and Pakistan reacts to that. Mm -hmm. Pakistan um, does, uh, you know, it, it feels somewhat vulnerable and insecure because mm -hmm. of that. But at the same time, Pakistan um, and China also have a very close relationship. Yes. And many in the region believe that the United States still towards India is well, well, partly for economic gains, because in India is such a huge market, mm -hmm. but also uh, it wants to build up India as a counter mm -hmm. uh, to, ch to counter China. Uh, China has had a, a very, as I mentioned, a very, very close strategic relationship with Pakistan. And there is also the perception that Chinese ulterior motives are really to uh, balance uh, Indian hegemony in the region mm -hmm. and because China and India also have a very interesting relationship. It features yes. both conflict and cooperation, although, you yes. know, and, and they've been to war. They have disputed territory, uh, but they have, uh, it, in the past few decades, since the 1990s, they have also been working, uh, they have, you know, worked on a close economic partnership. And in fact, China is making a lot of uh, um, uh, it's investing a lot of uh, develop, uh, you're investing into a lot of development projects in India. Mm -hmm. So a lot of foreign direct investment is coming from China. So both countries are benefiting from mm -hmm. that relationship. But at the same time, they're both very wary of each other. Mm -hmm. So the closer India gets to the United States, that uh, 
China and Pakistan come even closer, and they're they're quite close in any yes. case. As, and in fact, China is building this economic corridor, which is known as a, a CPEC China Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is a network of roads and railways and this infrastructure that will connect Western China all the way down mm -hmm. to Pakistan's um, Western port, Gawadar port, and gives it will give it very. Um, convenient access to markets in the Middle East, mm -hmm. it will be able to bypass um, a lot of, uh, you know, if it gets direct land access to Gavadar port from oh, yeah. China, it, it, it will be able to uh, bypass a lot of um, uh, traffic that goes through the sea lanes. Yes, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it saves a lot of money. So this is a $45 billion project, mm -hmm. and which has already started and which obviously is an indicator of this, uh, the close relationship, which is strategic uh, as well as economic. Um, Gavadar port actually, uh, which is in Pakistan's west, is controlled by the, by the Chinese, and it's mm -hmm. the success of Chinese foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So you see very interesting geopolitics uh, in the region. Right. Russia is also now, for the f in recent weeks, has had some joint military exercises yeah. with Pakistan for the first time, uh -huh. and which oh. is making India very nervous. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and they're not. So the Indian side is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, not very happy with that situation. How mm -hmm. is it developing? Right. So so uh, South Asians are watching mm. the developments in the United States, and they're waiting to see how the U.S. House. Uh, how the U.S. is going to change its positioning in South Asia, yeah. its footprint in South Asia. You mentioned Afghanistan, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, we are post-2014, and most of the international troops have withdrawn from Afghanistan, but mm -hmm. I believe there are still 10 to 15,000 uh, mm -hmm. American troops yes. over there, mm -hmm. pr primarily in a support role. But Afghanistan is still very much, I think, very much a textbook case of state failure, a country which has been a war zone for about four 40 years, mm -hmm. yes, uh, right? And uh, it is um, unable to sustain without um, support, international support, the government. And you see that since the withdrawal of international troops, you've seen uh, the, the, uh, the Taliban gaining territory again, and now they are apparently in control of 30% of the territory. Right, right. They're, they're claiming control of about, about, I believe, 70 districts yeah. in, in Afghanistan. So, so what is uh, the United States, how is the United States going to approach that? Mr. Trump has said he's going to, for instance, he's going to deal with ISIS, he's going to take care of ISIS, so people want, so it's unsure. So what are, going, what are the implications going to be for all the countries involved in the region, mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. in the Middle East as well as South Asia? How is he right, going to deal right. with the Taliban? Yes, yeah, the Taliban or other threats. And, you know, I think one of the, the sore points between the U.S. and Pakistan in recent years have been the drone strikes that yes. the U.S. has been conducting in the region. And if the U.S., um, you know, as far as uh, the cooperative relations with, with Pakistan in trying to deal with the, the neighbors as well as terrorism threat in the region, um, but with, with some regard for Pakistani sovereignty. I think that's been, that's been one of their, their grievances with the Obama administration. Yes. And with this new coming, I mean, it seems that Pakistan's relationships have really changed because, you know, we were talking about Afghanistan, its, it's importance to the United States in the, in the Cold War to help bring down the Soviet Union um, Pakistan was the conduit for the Mujahideen recruitment mm -hmm. into uh, Afghanistan and also to bring China uh, at the time, right, m not so global and capitalist, um, close, you know, norm help to normalize the relations. And now, now China and the U.S. are kind of at odds. And, and um, but, but, you know, Pakistan has always had kind of this this favored position because it's been important geopolitically to the U.S. But Donald Trump's kind of rhetoric has, has suggested he might want to keep the, the troops in Afghanistan, in, uh, uh, not just to deal with the Taliban threat there, but also to kind of because Pakistan is next door and he's, he's concerned about what's happening in that country. Right. So, so that would be interesting to watch how, what happens because as you're aware, uh, the drone policy, of course, it has soured relations between uh, Pakistan and the United States. I think it's more the people of Pakistan that have been concerned about its mm -hmm. sovereignty because 
based on statements and based on evidence, it, it appears that the Pakistani government did tacitly allow mm -hmm. the United States to conduct those drone uh -huh. strikes. Is that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's a lot of public pressure on governments, whether mm -hmm. it's a civilian government, which a uh, democratically elected government, or whether, you know, the military regime, yeah. the Musharraf regime, which apparently pr former President Musharraf suggested in one of the interviews that, yes, we allowed the United States to conduct those mm -hmm. drones. And these drones, because of the collateral damage, have been very, very, mm -hmm. um, have been a source of a lot of resentment toward the United States mm -hmm. in Pakistan. In fact, public opinion uh, has uh, has really um, deteriorated because mm -hmm. of the, uh, but at the same time uh, so president you know jo george bush started the drone campaign and when uh, president obama was elected the drone strikes went up by about four times mm -hmm. so they were increased uh, and of course that made uh, the situation worse and um, it's also in Pakistan, many people believe that the drone strikes have helped to recruit more terrorists mm -hmm. and that they have been a fodder for pro propaganda for the terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. So they have not been very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so a lot of things, probably differences in opinion between the popular opinion um, uh, as well as the, the, inter the state opinions because they have, they have their own dis reasons for making the decisions they have. Uh, well, thank you so much, Syra, for coming in to talk about this interesting topic. It, we'll certainly have to see about what happens under a Trump presidency, but certainly many different directions it could take um, and a very important region that you, you've helped us understand a bit better. Well, thank you, Grace. It's a very, very interesting outcome of the election, and I think we're all watching and we're all trying to be very optimistic, uh, optimistic and hoping for the best. Yes, let's hope so. All right. Thank you all for watching today. This is Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, here with Dr. Syra Yamin to talk about the next U.S. president and implications for peace and security in South Asia. Join us next Thursday at 1 p.m. and every Thursday at that time. Aloha.